Coming up on our newscast tonight. It's been 70 years since a horrific massacre took tens of thousands of lives on the island of Jeju-do. In a special ceremony to remember the victims, President Moon Jae-in vows never to let such tragedies be buried or distorted. South Korean musicians hold their final performance of their visit to Pyongyang. The North's artists reportedly reduced the length of their show to give more stage time to their southern counterparts. Local companies listed on the Kospi set a record high of double-digit growth. A rise of nearly 10% on year was made possible, mainly thanks to overall hike in exports. New Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, coming to you live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. I'm Daniel Che. President Moon Jae-in attended a ceremony marking the 70th anniversary of the April 3rd tragedy in Jeju. The third South Korean leader to issue an apology over the state violence made it clear efforts to uncover the truth and honor the victims should never end. Arirang's chief Chawande correspondent Moon Gun Young starts us off. turquoise huge water, coal black volcanic landscape. South Korea's southernmost island of Jeju is famous for its beautiful scenery and hearty local cuisine. But behind its sublime beauty lies a dark history. April 3, 1948 is attributed to a seven-year-long government civilian clash stemming from an ideological division during which tens of thousands of islanders were brutally killed. In the several decades after 1954, the country's authoritarian governments either distorted or covered up the truth in the name of public order and peace. April 3, 2018. Standing at a peace memorial park dedicated to anywhere between 14,000 and 30,000 victims, many of whose bodies were never found, President Moon Jae-in became only the third South Korean president to apologize for the ruthless massacre of 70 years ago. 국가 폭력으로 말미암은 그 모든 고통과 노력에 대해 대통령으로서 다시 한번 깊이 사과드리고 또한 깊이 감사드립니다. Efforts to find the truth and restore the honor of victims started in the late 1990s under the liberal president of the time, Kim Dae-jung, and were continued by his like-minded successor, Ro Mu-hyun, who became the first South Korean president to issue an official apology and attend a memorial service for the victims. But these efforts fizzled out as budgets were cut and research was stopped under the following conservative administrations. <laughs> Making note of those who still refuse to recognize the Jeju incident, President Moon called on the nation to face squarely the dark side of Korean history, free of ideological or political agenda. 우리는 오늘 사상 영령들 앞에서 평화와 상생은 이념이 아닌 오직 진실 위에서만 바로 설수 있다는 사실을 다시 확인하고 있습니다. The human rights lawyer turned president whose key campaign pledge was to find and establish the truth about the Jeju incident stressed that only then can we repent of the unfortunate past and recover the universal value of mankind. 여러분 제주에 봄이 오고 있습니다. Moon Gonyo, Arirang News. And shortly after the ceremony, President Moon held a luncheon with the relatives of the victims of that horrific incident and pledged to seek a complete resolution of the tragedy. 앞으로는 이제 누구도 우리 사삼을 부정하거나 폄훼하거나 또는 모욕하는 일이 없도록 사삼의 진실이 우뚝 서는 똑바로 서는 the liberal leader added he was glad to be able to keep his promise. During his election campaign, he pledged to attend the commemoration ceremony. Government officials, including Jeju Governor Won Hee-ryong, also took part in that event. The 
The president also visited a shrine at the April 3rd Peace Park where the memorial ceremony took place this morning and paid his respects to the victims of the massacre. Moon also left a message in the guest book expressing his determination to achieve reconciliation and coexistence. Staying with efforts to commemorate and discover the truth about the horrific massacre from seven decades ago, our Cha Sang-mi sheds light on what triggered the incident and why it's still not considered an official part of the nation's modern history. In 1947, the shooting of civilians by police during the March 1st Movement celebration triggered a period of turmoil on Jeju Island. A child at the march was run over by the police. As the crowd grew louder around the policeman who claimed he didn't know there was a kid, other officers started firing their guns at innocent people, killing six. If the government back then and the U.S. military government had apologized, this might not have become such a big incident. The April 3rd Jeju incident, a series of events that took place from 1947 to 1954, resulting in the highest number of casualties in modern Korean history, excluding the Korean War. Some 25,000 to 30,000 people were killed. It was a horrific massacre, but the truth behind the incident wasn't revealed until over half a century later. The then government distorted the incident as a communist riot and banned the public from even discussing it. There was a time when authors would get arrested if they published novels or literary pieces featuring this theme. Citizens' efforts to find the truth led to the special act on the restoration of honor of the victims in 2000. One of the public-level efforts includes a petition to obtain an official apology for the incident from the United States. We can't just blame the then U.S. government, but it's true they were behind the strategy and planning. Reconciliation movements have also been seen on Jeju Island recently, the families of the deceased and the police association making reconciliatory statements and paying tribute together. The general Korean public lacked understanding of the Jeju incident, often thinking it is just the history of Jeju. So the people of Jeju felt very isolated. But the incident is not just Jeju's history. It is our country's tragedy that we need to help heal and restore. The head of the National Museum says this is a horrendous event in Korean history. But many parts of the world nowadays are also experiencing similar tragedies and that through understanding and empathizing with the pain of Jeju incident, people can strive together to try and prevent similar tragedies in the future. Cha Sang-mi, Arirang News. The second and final special show by the South Korean art troupe in Pyongyang comes to an end. Local performers as well as the visiting artists fill the stage before a packed audience. Kim mo zooms in on the cultural exchange that brought the two sides closer together. The 160-member art troupe began their two-hour-long joint concert with their North Korean counterparts at around 3.30 p.m. South Korea time. Initially, the performance was set to begin an hour later, but was changed at the request of the South Korean side. This time around, the concert was held at the 12,000-seat Yugyeong Jeongjuyeong Gymnasium, which is eight times larger than the venue for the first performance held on Sunday. The venue is the same place where South Korean artists last performed in 2005. The group, which became the first South Korean troupe to perform in North Korea since then, consists of nearly a dozen artists, including legendary singers Cho Yong-pil and Lee Sun-hee, K-pop stars Red Velvet and Seohyun of Girls' Generation. Prior to the performance, a government official traveling with the troupe said that the North Korean troupe shortened its performance time to give more stage time to artists from South Korea. Under the title Spring Comes, the group, together with artists from North Korea, performed various pieces from both sides of the divided peninsula. Unlike the first concert on Sunday where Seohyun emceed by herself, this time she was accompanied by a North Korean male co-host, whose identity is yet to be revealed. After the concert, the head of North Korea's Samjian Orchestra, Hyun sung said she was happy with it. I'm glad because I think the concert went well. Both sides did well. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un attended the first concert on Sunday, but there were no word whether he was at Tuesday's performance. 
After the performance, the South Korean artists, together with Culture Minister To Jong Hwan, were scheduled to attend a dinner in Pyongyang at around 7:30 p.m. South Korea time, hosted by Kim Young Chul, a vice chairman of the Central Committee of North Korea's ruling Workers' Party. The troupe, together with a Taekwondo demonstration team, are then set to return to Incheon International Airport at midnight. Kim Mo Gyan, Arirang News. North Korean Foreign Minister Ri Yong-ho has met with Chinese State Councilor Wang Yi over in Beijing. The top diplomat and the, his counterpart from China are expected to have discussed pending issues brought up during last week's surprise meeting between the Chinese and North Korean leaders. Ri is making a stopover in the country before heading to Azerbaijan on Thursday to attend the Non-Aligned Movement Summit. According to diplomatic sources, it's uncommon for Ri to meet with local officials while making a transfer, adding it's a sign bilateral relations are on the mend. After schedule in Azerbaijan is complete, the North Korean foreign minister also plans to visit Russia to coordinate with Moscow on issues ahead of the historic summits with Seoul and Washington. 38 North refuted the Japanese foreign minister's recent claim that Pyongyang appears to be preparing for another nuclear test. According to the report by the U.S.-based North Korea monitoring site on Monday, analysis of commercial satellite imagery of the regime's nuclear test site does not back up Taro Kono's claim. It adds, in fact, satellite images of the Pungeri area from March 23rd show activity at the site has been significantly reduced compared to prior months. However, 38 North did mention the communist state is maintaining the readiness of the nuclear test facility. The Korean South Korea rival parties in the National Assembly are still deadlocked over contentious bills. A most concerning development as it could stall progress on other, mending is other pending issues, rather, namely the constitutional amendment. Kim min -ji has the latest from the domestic political arena. Rather than getting on with legislation, rival parties have made parliament a battleground. The April session that practically came to a standstill on its first day Monday, so no progress made on the second day either. The bickering began over key contentious bills. The ruling Democratic Party of Korea hopes to pass a bill establishing an investigative agency to deal exclusively with corruption among high-ranking officials, while the opposition wants to pass a revision to the Broadcasting Act that would guarantee neutrality and fairness of public broadcasters. The ruling party slammed the opposition parties for boycotting Monday's plenary session. They took aim at the main opposition Liberty Korea party in particular, saying the conservatives are making a habit of boycotting parliament rather than talking and trying to reach compromises. The conservative party, however, blamed the standstill in parliament on stubbornness in the ruling party. It said while the parliament ought to be making progress on key bills, including the revised Broadcasting Act, the ruling party is refusing to cooperate and is just looking for ways to win the June local elections. The centrist Padamita party also said that if the ruling party refuses to budge on the Broadcasting Act, then it won't cooperate on other matters. It also pointed out that it's the same bill the ruling party pushed for when it was in opposition, saying they can't just change their stance now that they're in power. This is the last extraordinary session ahead of the June elections, and there's concerns that the political bickering could hold up other key agendas, including talks on amending the constitution and deliberating the government's extra budget bill. Kim min -ji, Arirang News. Sentencing of Park geun will be televised live, another first in Korean history under her belt after becoming the first democratically elected president to be impeached. Last year, the Supreme Court amended the rules to allow the live broadcast in necessary circumstances and if the trial is of public interest. Her hearing is scheduled for this Friday at 2.10 p.m. local time. The former conservative leader was removed from office last year over a massive influence peddling scandal. She faces 18 charges including bribery, abuse of power and leaking government secrets. Prosecutors demanded a prison sentence of 30 years. There are plans to introduce advanced techs like virtual reality and big data to the nation's armed forces. Part of the government's defense reform drive as the military faces challenges, including a reduction in its ranks. Park ji gets us better acquainted with the new measures. The South Korean Defense Ministry announced Tuesday a set of measures to strengthen the armed forces using the latest information and communication technologies in an effort to address an expected reduction in military troops and to prepare for future challenges. 
The Defense Ministry plans to develop weapon systems using state-of-the-art information technologies, such as artificial intelligence and big data. We will also upgrade our training systems using virtual and augmented reality technologies. The Ministry will also use technology to create smart barracks for our troops. Artificial intelligence and big data will be used to improve and systematize South Korea's intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities to better analyze the video information sent by military satellites, drones and spy aircraft. The ministry also plans to develop an intelligent command and control system based on AI technology to ensure real-time analysis of battlefield situation and prompt decision-making. Also to improve military training, virtual reality or augmented reality technologies will be applied to various operations, in particular special operations simulations, submarine crew training and air base operation training. The country's military is to be reduced to around half a million personnel by 2022 from the current 625,000. And in view of that, more than 25 million U.S. dollars has been spent by the government on many multi-year defense projects aimed at using such technology to enhance the military's capabilities. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. South Korean firms listed on the country's main stock index reaped record net profits last year. The trend is mainly driven by export growth and solid chip sales. Won jong helps us look beyond the uplifting numbers. In 2017, the 533 companies listed on the KOSPI saw record net profits. According to Korea Exchange, the companies recorded a combined sales revenue of over 1 trillion 700 billion US dollars, a nearly 10% increase from the previous year. Their combined operating profits also grew to nearly 150 billion US dollars, a more than 28% increase from a year earlier. The record high figures are mainly a result of strong exports, especially in the semiconductor market. And according to an economic expert, the growth is likely to continue amid the strong recent performance of the global economy. The global economy is recovering uh, and overall global uh, GDP growth rate is well above 3 percent level. Uh, some people are estimating that this year might go up to 4 percent. So as long as the, uh, the global growth rate is picking up, the export-oriented countries such as Korea does benefit. But there is some concern as the strong performance of the KOSPI is being driven by a handful of large companies. The top 10 companies, including Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, generate more than 60 percent of the overall earnings. Its skewedness is extremely high. Now, why this is happening is because of the fourth uh, industrial revolution that's happening in global scale. Uh, as long as the uh, fourth industrial revolution accelerates, um, the demand for DRAMs and NAND uh, and memories are going to increase on exponential, exponential level. While South Korea's economy is benefiting from the fourth industrial revolution, the way the figures are skewed by the strong performances of a few companies highlights the need for a more balanced economy. Won jong -won, Arirang News. Shifting our focus to some unwelcome spikes now, consumer prices in Korea inched up again last month. Notable hike in the cost of agricultural products are seen as the key contributing factors. Kim ji yeon breaks down the digits for us. Consumer prices in Korea saw on-year increases in the 1 percent range for the sixth straight month in March. Statistics Korea says its consumer price index jumped 1.3 percent on-year. This is mainly due to price increases of agricultural products, which spiked by a whopping 4.7 percent compared to the previous year. In particular, the prices of grain, including the country's staple food rice, rose by more than 20 percent, the steepest rate of increase since June 1996. An official from the statistics agency says, however, that price increases of vegetables has slowed compared to the previous month as the weather has got warmer. Fisheries product prices, on the other hand, rose by more than 5 percent on year in March. 
The core inflation rate, which excludes volatile food and oil prices, also jumped by 1.3 percent on year. The prices of service fees increased as hiring fees for housekeepers climbed 11 percent in March on year, the sharpest rate of increase since December 2007. Food and beverage prices in eateries and bars also rose by 2.5 percent on year in March. An official from the statistics agency says, however, that it's not clear whether that's mainly due to the 16.4 percent increase in the minimum wage this year, currently at around 7 U.S. dollars an hour. Kim Jian, Arirang News. The first annual D-Economy Forum on Blockchain is taking place in Seoul this week. Experts from around the world have put their heads together to focus on the topic for day one, the state and future of that technology. Kim Yasung shares with us what was discussed. What's the state of blockchain and the future of cryptocurrency? Entrepreneurs, investors and cryptographers from across the world gathered in Seoul on Tuesday at the D-Economy Forum to tackle that question. Speakers included David Chom, the father of digital currency, who laid out the roots of blockchain technology in the early 1980s. This is a very exciting time for crypto. I think for crypto in Korea. Cryptography is the only way for individuals to really protect themselves in, the, in cyberspace in the digital world that we all saw coming. Blockchain is a digital ledger that records transactions across many computers without requiring a central administrator. The technology has been drawing enormous attention in recent years with startups and tech giants like Google and IBM and even major financial firms like J.P. Morgan Chase investing in it. Experts say blockchain technology, which backs cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, is key to the fourth industrial revolution as the rise of tech companies like Amazon, Uber and others means the demand for secure, reliable and cost-effective payment methods that can be used anywhere, anytime is set to soar. The goal of blockchain companies is to move money as easily as information moves in order to drive innovation. The technology has improved with faster decentralized software and enhanced security systems. I think payment systems is actually one of the least interesting things with the blockchain. One of the more interesting things is the business processes of corporations themselves. And now you're seeing things with smart contracts emerging and you're only seeing very early days, right? We're moving things from centralized exchanges into decentralized exchanges. It's growing very, very, very rapidly right now. And as it grows, obviously things change, they adapt, regulation comes in, consumer protection comes in. But really, it's growing as fast as any technology has ever grown. The consensus seems to be that blockchain technology is important, but that regulations need to follow at the same pace for innovation for it to really benefit the general public. Experts will discuss privacy, regulation and government taxation at the forum on Wednesday. Kim Hyesung. Arirang News. Time to turn to Michelle Park at the Weather Center for the updates you need. Michelle, the capital was under gray skies today and uh, signaling at rain to fall any moment now. Daniel, spring showers are in the forecast tonight. The central region, including Seoul, the northern Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon-do provinces, also tonight will start getting rain, while the southern regions will only get cloudier. The precipitation will eventually fall all across the country with up to 40 millimeters of precipitation in the upper regions, while less is expected down south. The central areas will be accompanied by strong winds and lightning, and so the abnormally high temperatures typical of this season will drop tomorrow. The daily highs, which have been reaching above 20 degrees Celsius, will fall down significantly by Thursday. Tomorrow's hour will begin the morning at 10 degrees Celsius, Daegu 14 degrees, Gyeongju lower at 10, while Busan is warmer at 15 degrees. Like I mentioned, the mercury won't rise much as high. Uh, Seoul topping out to 14 degrees, Gwangju 18, Gyeongju 11, Busan peaking up to 16 degrees. The rain is frequent this week, however, the weekend will be sunny and from Monday, the mercury will warm back up. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world.
These are all the stories we could pack into tonight's evening's edition of Arirang News Center. Thank you for staying with us as always. Thank <music> you.